in live now. Yeah, thank you, Exicon. Really welcome you all for this uh, API ICP postgraduate training program for this evening, especially during this auspicious days, uh, exploiting uh, more leisure time for many of the postgraduates can join to the live stream. And welcome you all for this uh, evening with a case discussion on uh, brainstem stroke. We have uh, eminent uh, faculty for this evening, the professor and head of the Department of Medicine of SRM uh, Medical College and the Institute and uh, Research, the Department of Medicine and Associate Dean of PG Academics, Dr. J.S. Kumar, sir. Welcome you, sir, for this program. And we have mm -hmm, Dr. Raj is also Professor in the Department of Medicine from Melmarutra Adhiparasakti Institute of Medical Science and Research. Welcome you, sir, for this evening. And we have Venisha. She is the postgraduate from SRM Institute and Medical Science and Research. And uh, request uh, the faculties to take over as well as the postgraduate start presenting the case. Over to you all both. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Vinisha. Good evening, sir. Um, I'm Dr. Sri Vinisha. I'm doing final year postgraduate in medicine. And um, my moderator is Dr. J.S. Kumar, sir. He's a HOD of general medicine uh, in SRM Medical College and Hospital, Potteri, sir. And I'm going to present about a patient uh, who is 56-year-old male and he's ailing from Chengalpet. He's a watchman by occupation, right-handed person, educated till fifth grade, sir. And informant is the patient, so the reliability is fair. Uh, he presented with chief complaints of giddiness associated with unsteadiness while walking since one day and deviation of angle of mouth to left side since one day with difficulty in swallowing food, sir. Okay, Vinisha. Yes, sir. Hold on. Previous slide. Let's go slide by slide. So you have a 56-year-old gentleman who is right-handed. And uh, what is the clinical relevance of handedness in uh, Nerve, I mean, in the central nervous system? Uh, sir, dominant, uh, for right-handed person, it is 90% left-dominant cerebral hemisphere, whereas in left-handed person, 60% it is uh, left-dominant, sir. So, while the patient is rehabilitating, if the patient has a lesion in left hemisphere, we have to give more rehabilitation because that is the one which is deals with language and uh, speech, sir. So, does it have any prognostic uh, prognostication that you tell the patient... For example, patient is a right-handed person and he has a uh, left uh, uh, SOL. So what could happen post-operative? So, post-operatively, patient can lose his language and speech skills. Uh, that's where, you know, that, that prognostication is also very important and quality of life. Yes, sir. So how do you look for uh, handedness? Uh, so patient can be asked to fold their hands in front of his chest, whichever hand is facing forward, the patient that is left, uh, dominant hand. And mm -hmm. also can be asked to view through a pinhole, sir. Whichever uh, eye is uh, predominantly using to view, that is a dominant uh, side, sir. Okay. They can if ask the patient, the patient to stand at ease also. Yes, okay, sir. So that usually uh, a right-handed person in Indian culture there is always a, uh, I mean, there was some forced way of just getting them into right-handed, even if they are left-handed, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah, because they, I mean, by and large, majority feel that right-handed person, I mean, that's what it culturally accepted. So, but when it is an uh, right eye, it is always right eye because people never want to change that eye. Eyedness is going to be the same. Yes, handedness and eyedness will not go together. So we have to give more importance for the eyedness rather than the handedness if you have a doubt. Okay. Yes, okay. Thank you. Next. Then what about the key complaints? Uh, the present one? with giddiness, with unsteadiness while walk, walking, sir. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by giddiness? Can you... So is giddiness uh, and the vertigo the same? Uh, no, sir. Giddiness means subjective feeling where the patient has small adjustment with the environment. A vertigo, it is an illusion of uh, rotation. It can be subjective or objective. That is because of mismatch between visual, um, proprioception and um, central also, sir. Visual, proprioception and central. Vestibular. Okay. Vestibular. So next, uh, then comes your deviation of angle of mouth. So what do you infer from that? 
um, so patient is having a facial nerve lesion, a deviation of angle of, with just the history, we cannot rule out whether it's UMN or LMN. So just uh, left side uh, deviation, it can either be a UMN lesion or an LMN facial nerve lesion, sir. And what about the third complaint? Difficulty in swallowing food, it can be either a neurogenic cause or a uh, occlusive cause, sir. Or peripheral cause, neurogenic or peripheral cause. Uh, neurogenic cause, the patients will have uh, uh, difficulty in swallowing more towards liquid than solid, where it's a peripheral or occlusive lesion, patient will have um, swallowing defects more to solids than liquids, sir. Okay. And uh, okay. do you know what are the phases uh, in the act of swallowing? Uh, so first is the uh, chewing phase, which is uh, mediated by trigeminal nerve. After that, patient first they'll try to chew, and after with the help of tongue, they'll try to roll and make a, a globus of food and propel it backwards. After that, the pharyngeal phase will start, uh, followed by esophageal phase. Sir. Okay, so for the uh, chewing phase, you said it is the trigem trigeminal nerve defect, sir. Okay. So which muscle acts on that? Chewing phase. Um... Mesita, sir. Mesita, yeah. Mesita. Mesita. Then what happens later on? The patient will try to roll his tongue and make the food into a bolus, sir, and try to swallow it with the help of hypoclosal nerve. Before sir. that, what will, before that, what what should happen to make it into a bolus? The food can be in the pouch, isn't it? The buccal pouch. Uh, actually, Savantana will, will try to... Savantana will aid, sir, help. Uh, which muscle? Mm. Um, vaccinators, I'm not sure. Correct. Vaccinator. Vaccinator. So from, yeah, from the food from the buccal pouch is got into the floor of the mouth. Then only our, uh, I mean, the tongue starts into act into make it into bolus and then thrust it. And yes. which starts the uh, end of the pharyngeal and the starting of the esophageal. Yes. Okay. Okay, and which is uh, which happens first, and how do you know whether it's an UMN or LMN? So with the swallowing, sir. Yeah, swallowing. Um, UM history, history. Any vague idea whether there be nasal regurgitation, sir? No, no sir. The swallowing. UMN initially difficulty will uh, in UMN lesion the difficulty will be on the swallowing liquids because it requires. Um, that we call it the kinetic melody. Hmm? So the kinetic melody gets affected you and first, whereas uh, when you have a for element, you will be having uh, uh, what you call it is for the forceful thing. So it is for the solid foods. Then later on, both solid and liquid are the same. They will have difficulty. Okay. So initially, the patient says I had difficulty in taking liquids followed by solid. Then probably in history, we should get into so some kind of a, these are the clues. These are kind of like, you know, jigsaw pieces. We may not get the picture, but at least we may come close to the picture. Okay. But if it's the element, definitely you will have other, uh, I mean, you have the ninth and 10th, I mean, you said the glossopharyngeal and the vagus comes into play. Yes. But the human, usually you have, along with that, uh, what else you will have? Apart from that, what will be along the history if it is going to be human? Along with difficulty in swallowing, voice changes will be there. So, host, voice right. changes will be present. Uh, so, what voice changes? Plastic dysarthria in case of human lesion and flaccid in case of element with nasal twang to the speech present, sir. Oh, what do you call that lesion? It's, it's a pseudo bulbar. Pseudo bulbar palsy and bulbar palsy. Okay, continue the next slide. Um, so, the, uh, the uh, elaborating the history of presenting illness, if patient was apparently asymptomatic on 1st of January this year after finishing his work. Uh, in the evening, patient had complaints of headache. The patient describes a headache uh, as dull aching, non-throbbing and non-pulsatile, which was present in the front of head, sir. Associated with nausea, but no visual abnormalities. He took some analgesics and went to sleep. On waking up the next morning, he had giddiness. Patient describes a giddiness in his own terms as spinning of himself, progressive and persistent, and there was no change in posture or head movement. There was no aggravating or relieving factors for the giddiness with no visual obscurations. Uh, no associated ear discharge or tinnitus. No associated nausea or vomiting symptoms with the giddiness, sir. Okay, Vinisha, can you just uh, elaborate? Uh, is this headache a cause of concern? Or uh, it is just an... 
So which means maybe with headache, most see malignant is one is uh, headache due to intracranial tension, so which is most commonly present in occipital headache, and it will be associated with projectile vomiting and diplopia eye visions. Patient didn't have any all the, uh, any of these, and uh, red flag signs of headache we can take only one thing is patient's age is fifty, so above fifty, uh, and it is not a new onset or severe headache of his lifetime. It doesn't describe as, as that, sir. So, it uh, based on the history. Uh, not a malignant headache, sir. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, but uh, which all headache you'll take it as a cause of concern? A uh, patient having headache after 50, 50 years of age, a headache associated with projectile vomiting, neurological deficit headache, headache associated with visual obscurations. Mm -hmm. um, a new a severe headache of his lifestyle, a headache of a lifetime, thunderclap headache. Mm -hmm. Very good. Then? Diplopia is a headache associated with visual abnormalities, defective Very vision. Very good. Headache associated with history of head trauma in the just prior to that. Okay. So, uh, any any headache, I mean, headache which can wake the person from the sleep? They are, yes, uh, night, awake, uh, morning awakening headache. So. As soon as the patient gets up, he gets up with a severe headache, headache. which is not uh, amenable to analgesics. Yes, sir. And why is that uh, occipital region you said, no? It uh, has poor autoregulation, sir. Okay. So, which region, occipital region has a poor autoregulation? And what else could also be uh, uh, associated symptom that... Amorosis you fugus, the chance in visual obscurations can be there, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, due to? Uh, due to um, there is shift of fluid in the retina and ganglion layer, sir. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and uh, I don't know. one important artery that goes internal carotid artery sir uh, uh, then central little artery sir no 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 see uh, you have a posterior cerebral artery yes sir so is the compression of the posterior cerebral artery above the tentoria especially when the neck is being forced to bend or patient bends the neck so there is a compression that can lead on to amorosis fugues. The kind of so amorosis feedbacks. Okay. okay. Up and rest, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So I'm following, sir. Uh, okay. She's presenting I nicely on me. Okay. Uh, two questions, ma'am. Uh, yes, so you said uh, history wise, how can you find out whether it is thrombosis or whether it is hemorrhage or whether it is embolic? Uh, so hemorrhage, there would be pre previous history of any ex uh, uh, activity. So during activity, patient would have. And uh, uh, hemorrhagic, the maximum, um, th thrombosis, the maximum, uh, it doesn't, it progress over hours and days. Sir. Hemorrhage will progress over minutes and seconds and minutes. will be very rapidly progressive in nature. Sir. Embolic, they'll present initially stuttering, hit, stuttering uh, hemiplegia, like uh, TIA, which slowly keeps progressing, like a stroke in evolution, sir. Stroke in evolution is usually a feature of thrombotic. Uh, Thromb uh, patient will have TIA, multiple infarcts, yeah. emboli, sir. So, usually emboli will be presenting with the severity from the beginning. Okay. And after that, it will be relieved. Oh. Okay. Hemorrhagic, again, it can present severely as well as it can increase over a period of time due to the bleeding is increasing. But a thrombotic is the one where presentation we can be mild. Okay, in the beginning, and after some time, it can gradually increase, okay. gradually increase, and can reach the maximum, right? Reach a plateau after some time. So this is called stroke in okay, evolution. Stroke in evolution. Okay. So usually, what is the time that thrombotic uh, um, stroke will occur? Mostly more awakening strokes, sir. Morning okay, awakening awake. strokes. So morning and uh, try to get up, so they will be having a stroke. Embolic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke are at the height of activity. exertion or uh, physical activity, sir. Physical activity. Okay, which is more common, ma'am? Thrombotic headaches, sir. Headaches. Thrombotic strokes. Thrombotic strokes are more common. In younger ages, in young strokes. Embolic strokes are more common. Okay. So, what are the types of embolic strokes? Mm -hmm. Cardio embolic and another, another one is? Arterial. Arterial. Uh, Atherosclerotic embolic, embolic strokes. Atherosclerotic embolic strokes. Cardiac embolic strokes are common in young people. Atherosclerotic emboli are more common in the elderly. Okay. 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 Continue. 
ஆக்சிஜன் <laughs> Um, pain due to pain uh, pain there are pain sensitive structures sir that is getting affected uh, like um pain is uh, pain sensitive structures in uh, see, cranial uh, uh, one is scalp skin scalp uh, in, in this in, no, in this condition when there is a raised intracranial pressure no idea sir because of the dura the dura is so, stretching stretching oh. okay oh. yeah. um patient also has unsteadiness which he describes as swaying to right while patient tries standing or walking and persistent uh, aggravated on postural change and not assess with involuntary movements uh, no history of increase in the unsteadiness while patient is in dark or while washing his face uh, no history of feeling ground like cotton wool the same day patient also noticed deviation of angle of mouth to left and history of difficulty in closing right eye with drooling of saliva from right side of mouth no history of decreased perception of taste of food he consumed uh, history of difficulty in swallowing foods for both solids and liquids associated with nasal regurgitation and cough while trying while trying to swallow uh, but patient is able to chew food no history of pain while swallowing and no complaints of choking sensation in the chest while swallowing uh he also had hoarseness of voice present uh, with a nasal twang to his speech okay so what could be the reason for each of the positive symptoms that you have told sir so, uh, unsteadiness as swaying to right uh, it is an attack said can either be a cerebral or central cause or a uh, vestibular cause so both central and peripheral causes are there for that and okay. uh, but that was not aggravated on postural change i for ruling out uh, doesn't rule out but uh, postural changes or head movements can aggravate the peripheral cause of vertigo as well as patient can have orthostatic hypotension which he described that unsteadiness so that is ruled out and uh, involuntary movements i asked for cerebral limbs sir if he had any involuntary movements uh and also the symptoms increasing in dark or while washing face that is wash basin sign for posterior column uh both ruled out and uh, ground like cotton wool also the sensation i asked for posterior column so posterior column is ruled out with the history and uh, peripheral cause for vertigo is ruled out sir and going to the next symptom he had is deviation of angle of mouth to left sir so uh, and then did yes, you sir. in your history have you mentioned anything about vomiting or nausea uh no sir i uh, before there was no history of vomiting or nausea and along with the unsteadiness of gait so, okay. before right with giddiness there was no acid nausea or vomiting unsteadiness also there was no nausea or vomiting sir okay so if vomiting is severe or nausea is severe you think is a peripheral or a central cause um a central cause will have uh, more of vomiting and peripheral will have more of nausea sir yeah because uh, peripheral will have the symptoms will be always on the higher side this okay. is not it's a myth that central cause is always uh, producing symptoms of vomiting is much more severe in peripheral than compared to again relative terms okay. than uh, central cause and what will be the other uh, i mean thing that you said the patient swaying yes sir so this is a peripheral cause patient try to uh, try to sway away from the site of pathology that you should have in mind okay sir you will not now when you start examining you should be looking into those things okay, okay. and there must be some associated symptoms that uh, you will have to mention 
any ear uh, ear pain ear uh, discharge no, sir. There, was no, uh, like, there was no ear ache or ear discharge sir uh, that all you should tell me that which in history itself will give you a clue whether we are dealing with a peripheral or a central cause okay sir what else will how will um, what are the other differentiating factors between uh, central and peripheral uh, peripheral vertebral in history on examination but then we go with all the probably the now itself anything uh, that peripheral vertebral can be um, peripheral vertical uh, acute episodic transient but central will be persistent progressive and peripheral can increase with head movements uh, with ear ache, ear discharge and tinnitus complaints uh, sent okay. uh, then will nystagmus give you any clue whether it is a yes, peripheral it is um, central or peripheral, uh, central nystagmus, there will be nystagmus even on fixation and uh, the gaze evoke, uh, it can be either be vertical or horizontal or, or uh, rotational. Peripheral vertigo, there will not be, sorry sir. Central, right? You said you are yes, first saying central. Central, central okay. nystagmus. And uh, peripheral nystagmus, there will not be nystagmus on fixation and it can never be vertical. It can either be horizontal or uh, rotational. And with central nystagmus, it, uh, the nystagmus fast component towards the site of lesion. And with peripheral, the fast component will be toward, away from the site of lesion to the opposite side, sir. Okay. And which is transient? Which... Uh, peripheral nystagmus is quite transient. Central is persistent and it is not fatigable. Peripheral nystagmus is fatigable also, sir. Always one thing you said, I just want to reiterate for other postgraduates who are hearing. Periphery is usually always horizontal nystagmus. Uh, yes. But in central, it can be, as you said, it can be a uh, vertical nystagmus. Yeah, it can be any direction. Okay? Yes. That's a simple thing that, that you should know. Okay? Yeah. What else you want to tell uh, about the hoarseness of voice and the present of uh, nasal twang? What are these due to? Uh, because of uh, nine, uh, ninth and tenth nerve palsy, sir. Uh, with nasal mm -hmm. twang, so probably it is an element, sir. If it's a human patient, will have like a hot potato patient, like speaking from the back of the tongue, back of the throat voice, sir. Mm -hmm. Which one you're telling about the? Uh, so you're we now we talk about on the dysarthria part, isn't it? Sir. Okay. So, what is dysarthria? Um, difficulty in articulating, sir. Mm -hmm. Difficulty in articulating. It can either be spastic or flaccid. Um, dyskinetic, ataxic, and frontal dysarthria. Uh, flaccid is an element palsy of nine and ten, and uh, that is uh, bulbar and spastic and pseudo bulbar palsies. Uh, so spastic patient will have like a hot potato speaking from the back of the throat, but a uh, pseudo bulb, uh, but with element palsy, it will be like a uh, nasal twang will be there to his speech, sir. Uh, dyskinetic can either be hypo or hyper. Why should be there a nasal twang to the speech? Uh, because the palate, uh, uh, it is um, palate is flaccid, so, so. No, it is the pharyngeal muscles because the nasal aperture is opened. It doesn't close. The pharyngeal muscles are not closed properly. Okay. So you have the air being let out. So through the you have that nasal twang. Okay, sir. Hmm. And um. Uh, dyskinetic can either be hypo or hyper. Hypo is uh, occurs in uh, patients with uh, Parkinson's without that nasal process, that prosodio speech will be absent, sir. Hyperkinetic with chorea, patients with chorea, um, hyperkinetic. Ataxic speech is cerebellar speech. It can either be staccato or scanning speech. Scanning is a patient will uh, separate each syllable and talk. So, speech, there will be forceful, ex uh, forceful nature to particular syllables. Sir. And the frontal... Um, Dysarthria is also there. So it is seeing in uh, patients, uh, children with intellectual disabilities. So kind of, you know, kiddish, childish talk, we call it. Oh, okay, sir. How will you differentiate between dysarthria and dysphasia? Or a dysphasia? Okay. What is the thing that is pertinently different between these two? Um, it is language. In dysarthria, there is normal language. Yes, sir. So this is only. Yeah, uh, the language also. So what is what do you? I mean, how will you define language? Um, language is what uh, the ability to convert whatever you are think, thinking into a mode of communication, sir. Uh, it can either be writing or speaking or like uh, uh, showing with your hands or the signs using signs. Okay. Now one more thing would be repeating repetition. Uh, okay, sir. Repetition. Yeah. Next. Next. Yes, sir. Next. Yes, sir. 
uh, okay uh, so, so since i has gone into the aphasia so what are the aphasia in um so uh, i can either uh, fluent aphasia non fluent aphasia transcortical aphasia um um then conductive aphasia nominal aphasia nominal aphasia and conduct conductive aphasia so transcortical motor and sensory aphasia okay. um okay so what is the blood supply for uh, learning area what is the blood supply for uh, so for anterior limb of middle cerebral artery for wernicke's and uh, posterior uh, is um, superior superior for both are middle cerebral artery sir yeah yeah superior branch for and um, wernicke um, brocus and uh, inferior for uh, wernicke sir so if the stem is affected it could be a global global aphasia global aphasia so what is conductive aphasia uh conductive aphasia okay, where the arcuate facilis is affected where the patient's uh, repetition will be intact sir the repetition will be intact or affected um repetition will be repetition only will be affected sir uh, repetition only will be affected both the fluency and comprehension no, is present present okay. so unless in the brokers where fluency will be affected comprehension will be intact but repetition will be lost so yes, Yeah, in transcortical motor, since it has no direct relationship with the uh, arcuate fasciculus, so they will behave like the typical Broca's and uh, typical uh, Wernicke's, except for the preservation of repetition. Okay. Yes. In conductive aphasia, all other things will be normal except for repetition. Okay. Yes. Sir. So, which is the most common type of aphasia? Most common Broca's, sir. Nominal aphasia. Oh, so, yes. Nominal aphasia is somewhat most. No. Okay, so what is? Yeah, continue. Um, uh, no history of uh, no history of speech, mem memory disturbance, loss of consciousness, behavioral disturbance, delusions or hallucinations, seizures. Uh, no history of loss of smell, double vision, drooping of eyelids, or deviation of eyeball. Uh, no issue of difficulty in chewing food or uh, per reduced perception of sensation over face while washing his face. Uh, no issue of hard of hearing or complaints of tinnitus. No issue of difficulty in turning side to side, uh, head side to side, or shrugging of shoulders. No issue of difficulty in protruding tongue, rolling tongue from side to side. So, so no issue suggestive of other cranial nerve involvement, sir. Hmm. Anisha, you said uh, no. Uh, what do you call? Fourth one, difficulty in chewing or reduced perception of sensation over face while washing the face, right? No, sir. Um, and while washing face, it's able to perceive the um, sensations. Sir. Yes, sir. Ah. There's no history. What is the importance in this uh, history of knowing the perception of sensation over face? Uh, you are trying to rule out? Uh, spinal nucleus of trigeminal involvement is not there, sir, with the history. Mm hmm so can you tell me a little on that particular thing on the sensation what do you mean by the perioral numbness what is that onion peel? onion skin appearance or baklava helmet appearance that is the it is not the appearance it is the the pattern of involvement of numbness, numbness. Uh, so the arrangement of fibers of spinal nucleus of trigeminal in upper uh, cervical uh, in upper cervical region is such that uh, the the perioral is caudally represented and the uh, periphery part is cranially uh, present, sir. Okay, prostal and caudal or anterior or superior, whichever way you want to describe. Sir. So, caudally, you tell me. So, um, if the posterior or caudal effect is there, which, how is it affected? Periorally, sir. Uh, so, patient will have perioral sensations lost first, sir. Perioral? Sensations lost first in the onion ring pattern. Yeah, onion ring pattern is called onion peel, not onion, onion ring. ring yeah. So when you have the uh, onion peel involvement, the perioral represents always. It is a caudal or the I mean, is it po is posterior or superior? You you are um, mixing it up. Uh, sorry, sir, I'm not sure about that. The perioral will be a rostral or the anterior. Okay. Anterior. And, Okay, and the so you the only you go the posterior only you will have the the perioral representation is the rostral one, okay, because of the and how many okay that we'll talk about later, and what else you said the 
double vision anything to do with this particular uh, system that i mean case that you are presenting um what class for double vision so diplopia uh, patient had headache so into intracranial increase intracranial pressure can present with diplopia yeah. uh, no in this particular because you are presenting one you, you have one diagnosis for the day isn't it yes, so uh, whether is there any kind of a connect between when you say there is no history of double vision uh, sir horn uh, no so horn so also there will be ptosis only there will not be double vision but uh, okay. even uh, no history of drooping of Yes, sir, there was no history of drooping of eyelids. Yeah, before the double vision, uh, in context with the case that you are presenting, this is you are taken for as far as a, a performa in all cases, isn't it? Yes, sir. How will you connect these two? The today's sir, case. Uh, ML of lesions can have internal. Exactly, uh, that's what. ML yes. of lesions. Uh, okay, so you are trying to tell me there is no probably involvement of medial longitudinal fasciculus, isn't it? Yes, sir. See, you, when you present this pro forma wise, you should always try to find out what is the relevance to the case that you are presenting. So this may be the kind of questions, you know, that examiner will put all, out of the blue. You should, you know everything, but only way is that you try to link. Okay. Okay. Continue. Um, no issue of difficulty in buttoning and unbuttoning sh shirts, pillage by taking food, difficulty in mixing food, combing hair, raising arm above head, and difficulty in bringing food to mouth. No issue of difficulty in holding on to slippers or tripping over toes while walking, difficulty in clearing obstacles, uh, buckling of knees, difficulty in getting up from chair, difficulty in rolling bed. Uh, no issue of difficulty in holding the neck or raising head from pillow. So, in total, patient doesn't have history suggestive of proximal or distal limb, uh, trunk or limb. Uh, uh, power involvement, sir. Aparna, sir. Uh, yes, sir. sir. There is no motor involvement in this case. Okay. So you want to say there is no motor in, uh, yes, sir, There is no motor involvement. Motor. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, is able to perceive the cloth he is wearing and able to appreciate hot and cold sensation while bathing and washing his face. Uh, no issue of numbness, pins and needles or burning sensation of sole of feet. Uh, no issue of band-like sensation or electric shock-like sensation. Uh, no issue of smearing of foot over face, involuntary movement, oscillations while seeing object. Is able to mixture it four to five times a day, can feel bladder fullness and initiate the process with no dribbling or retention of urine. No issue of bubble disturbance and abnormal sweating. No issue of headache with the projectile vomiting, double vision or neck stiffness. No issue of preceding trauma or recent vaccination, dog bite. No issue of preceding fever, loose stools, loss of appetite or weight. Are any questions from your side, sir? No, it's okay. I mean... Okay. So you have, to, you have mentioned all those things which... So what are the, uh, so far, okay, next slide, then before you conclude the yeah. history. Next, yeah. uh, past history, patient was diagnosed with diabetes mellitus two years ago, but he was not on any treatment after that. No host of hypertension, coronary artery disease, seizure disorder, tuberculosis, thyroid disorder. No host of similar complaints in the past or history suggests of transient ischemic attacks. No past history of COVID infection. Uh, patient consumes mixed diet, no host of smoking or alcohol consumption, and patient denies high risk behavior. Family history is not contributory, sir. Any previous history of TA? No, sir. No past history of TA, sir. Okay. So, what are the modifiable risk factors present in this patient? Uh, only history. diabetes, sir. With the history, it gave diabetes. Modifiable. Non modifiable. Is a male? Is a male after 56 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, so Both gender and uh, ages in family. Okay. Is, is he obese? Uh, it's no, sir. Adequately, moderately next, building. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so, the summary of the history is a 56 year old male, a known diabetic, not on treatment. He presented with complaints of unsteadiness of gait with swaying to right of one day duration. And there is a history suggestive of involvement of cranial nerves 7, 9, and 10. Uh, but there is no history suggestive of corticospinal tract involvement or spinothalamic tract or bowel or bladder involvement. With just the history, we can localize it to 
uh, medulla probably in the right side. Etiology being cerebrovascular accident, probably secondary to vascular cause. So, you made a diagnosis of CVE. Okay. Yes, so, what is dense hemiplegia? Uh, dense hemiplegia in area, internal capsule where the fibers are very close. Whenever it gets affected, patient will have complete hemiplegia, sir. So, dense hemiplegia is the one in which both upper limb and lower yeah. limb are involved equally. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Are involved equally. So, that is called dense hemiplegia. And most common cause for dense hemiplegia is internal capsule initial. Okay, what is brachial hemiplegia or what is crural hemiplegia? Uh, crural is only lower limbs affected. Brachial is only upper limbs affected, sir. Crural can be seconded to... Uh, uh, not, only, not only, not uh, only, more affected. Okay, sir. More affected. And where is the lesion? Uh, sir, for uh, bilateral, uh, for uh, uh, crural, uh, probably seconded to unpad anterior cerebral artery infarct, sir. Okay, so what it's is... It's a cortical type of... No, sir. Please cut it. Please cut it. Okay. It's a cortical, cortical lesion. Okay. In the cortical lesion, you'll be getting this. So, okay, sir. You can... So, what is crossed motor hemiplegia? Crossed? Oh, uh, facial nerve in one side and um, uh, hemiplegia on the opposite side, sir. Come again? Uh, facial nerve in one uh, side. Okay. Element facial nerve in one side and uh, opposite side hemiplegia, sir. Mm -hmm. What is hemiplegia cruciata? Uh, this occurs whenever the infarct is uh, the um, upper limb fibers uh, of corticospinal tract will decussate in the upper medulla, while the lower limb fibers will decussate in the lower medulla. So, whenever there's infarct in this region, there will be uh, ipsilateral upper limb involvement, contralateral lower limb involvement, sir. That is crossed motor hemiplegia. Hemiplegia cruciata, sir. Same, yeah. So, again, they're talking about the, where is the lesion? Medulla, sir, upper medulla. Yeah. So these are the questions that you will be, uh, you should be answering when you're localizing a, your lesion probably in medulla based upon history. So if there is a headache in this patient, now yes. what is the cause? Is it vascular. So yes, what, what will, what is vascular causes? Since you said it's a CBA, right? Yes, sir. With Especially vascular. when you're talking medulla is, the, yeah, medulla is the area of... So what are things that can happen? See, cerebral venous thrombosis can happen in that area, sir. Mm -hmm. Cerebral venous thrombosis. Okay. Uh, vascular... Uh, it can be... Yeah, when it comes to medulla. So it's mostly... We are talking about headache and then uh, we are talking about a cerebrovascular accident which, uh, which is causing... Um, a thrombus, a thromba, thromboembolic phenomena with the localization in medulla. Are you, I mean, did you understand my question? Yes, sir. So, so what are the... Uh, about medulla. So medulla means which system, which uh, vascular structures we are, uh, is it in your mind that you are looking into? Is it the anterior uh, circulation or the posterior circulation? Posterior circulation, sir. So when there is a posterior circulation and you feel the medulla is probably the uh, area that is affected, what could be the you said the etiology is vascular cause. I sir, want to uh, most probably an inf infarct seconded thrombosis, sir. Okay. Especially when there is a headache, because you said there is a headache. Headache. So Vertical now I have to connect all the dots. Uh, Remember? Vertical okay, hmm. dissection, sir. Yes, this is what it can be a most probably a vertebral dissection. We it usually in all our uh, other uh, cardiovascular like hemiplegia. Or paraplegia, we never talk about dissection. But here, when you're talking about medulla, and especially posterior circulation, you should think of uh, dissection of the vertebral artery as one of the cause. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dissection play. Then one of the common cause of dissection, uh, leading on to the presentation that you have made, I mean, it's been reported widely. Okay. But one important thing you should always remember is that, can hemorrhage be there? Unlikely, sir. Unlikely, yeah, because hemorrhage has been never reported. Okay. Um, okay. So, 
Uh, going on to the general examination of the patient, a uh, patient is uh, adequately built and nourished, conscious and oriented to time, place and person. Uh, no pallor, no sin itchress, no sinosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy and pain edema. Uh, no xanthalisma, tendon xanthomas, acanthosis nigricans and nicotine staining. Uh, pulse rate is 80 beats per minute, regular, normal in volume with no special character. All peripheral pulse is palpable with no radio femoral delay. Condition of vessel wall is normal. Uh, blood pressure in the right upper limb is 170 by uh, 100 mmHg and uh, left upper limb is 180 100 in supine position with no postural drop. Uh, respirate rate is 18 per minute and carotids, there were no broi, no broi and JVP is not elevated. Vinisha, what have you missed? In the general examination? Um, other neurocutaneous markers, sir. What other neuro? You have not mentioned any neurocutaneous markers. Yes, I, okay, sir. Because I thought it is more of a CVA, I took into only the atherosclerotic markers, sir. No, so, no. neurocutaneous markers of TB, HIV. No, no. Not TB, HIV. Neurocutaneous marker. So, what are the neurocutaneous markers that is probably relevant in this patient? Okay. Tell me the neurocutaneous markers that you have been. Um, so, phacomatosis like uh, cafeolimacules, adenoma sebaceum, uh, no, neurofibrom. For, for uh, cafeolimacules, falls in which condition? Oh, acoustic neuromas, sir. The acoustic neuromas. Where, where do the acoustic neuroma happen? Sir, quantum medullary junctions. Sir. Are we, your your uh, area of interest is no medulla? Yes, sir. So I should have. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. That's very important. Don't take anything for granted because an examiner is looking at how systematic you are uh, writing the case sheet. So please, in just one word of neurocutaneous. Sir, tell me about the other neurocutaneous markers. Um, adenoma sebaceum, sir. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Which condition? Uh, tuberous sclerosis, sir. Other uh, neuro other markers in tuberous sclerosis. Um, epilepsy, low intelligence, abnormal observations. Hmm. Chagrin patch? Ah, chagrin patch, sir. Chagrin patch. Okay. What uh, is problem in this patient? You, I could see he is diabetic and now you are bringing in hypertension also. Yes, sir. In a condition. It means it's... So BP is 170-100, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. So, what about the fundus? Uh, fundus, no evidence of papilledema or hypertensive retinopathy, sir. I'm interested. Papilledema, okay, but both hypertensive retinopathy means to, to tell you that the patient has not been hypertensive for yes. long period of time. Yes, sir. Hmm. Okay, continue. Uh, central nervous system examination, higher mental function, patient is conscious and uh, right-handedness, oriented to time, place and person, immediate, recent and remote memory, all three were intact. Uh, with respect to speech and language, his comprehension, naming and reputation is intact. Uh, with fluency, he had difficulty in articulating guttural sounds like G and ng, uh, no emotional instability. Which condition you get emotional instability? Uh, cortical lesions, sir. And pseudobulbar palsy also. Pseudobulbar palsy. Bulbar palsy, yeah. Okay. Apandra, sir, anything on this slide, sir? No, sir. We can uh, proceed, sir. Yeah. So already we talk about the speech and language. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, a cranial nerve examination is able to perceive smell. Uh, visual acuity is normal. Field of vision is normal. Color vision normal. Fundus, no papilledema and hypertensive retinopathy. Uh, three, forces, three, three, four and six cranial nerve. There was no ptosis or strabismus. Extracular muscles free and full. Direct and indirect light reflex present in both the eyes. Accommodation reflex present. Horn is absent. Both the eyes. Trigeminal nerve sensation over face and buccal mucosa present is able to clench, protrude the jaw and move the jaw side to side. Corneal conjunctival reflex present in both sides and jaw jerk is not exaggerated. Okay. So what is the importance of corneal and conjunctival reflex in this case? So, so fifth nerve is afferent for corneal conjunctival. Afferent, afferent for corneal conjunctival. No, no. Uh, fifth mm -hmm. nerve is different for. Uh, for yes, sir. Fifth nerve is. Uh, if there is a lesion, fifth nerve. Hmm. Tell me. Corneal, uh, if there's a lesion, fifth nerve, corneal conjunctive reflex can get affected, sir. Okay. 
what is that very something very important between a corneal and conjunctival reflex? No, you have a lot of dissociated dissociated sensory, you know. So you have also something called when there is going to be a brainstem lesion, you have to be very careful. Here the corneal and conjunctival reflex in your in this particular case is very important because the corneal reflexes, the uh, reflex come from the spinal tract. Okay, sir. Isn't it? But when it comes to the congenital reflex, it is absorbed by the medulla. So you may have a dissociated corneal and congenital reflex when it comes when you talk about an intrinsic brainstem. Okay, leak, okay, involving the fifth nerve tract. Okay. okay. So when you have a congenital reflex that has uh, been affected, then you know it is medulla that has been there, but corneal is present, but uh, congenital may not be, uh, may be sluggish. Okay. Oh. So there is this is called a dissociated corneal congenital reflex. So be very careful when we are talking when you are having a problem with the industry brainstem. Oh. You have to be careful in noting this. Okay, continue. Um, right. patient law, the nasolabial fold is obliterated in the right side. Wrinkling of forehead is reduced in the right side, and right eye the opening is uh, reduced against resistance. Deviation of angle of mouth to left side, blowing of chicken is able to hold the hair in the mouth, and taste in anterior two third of the trunk is intact. Uh, vestibular and eighth uh, nerve, Remy's test is positive in both ears, and there is no lateralization with peppers. Okay. Okay. Why uh, human type of facial palsy alone is present? Sorry, sir. Uh, uh, in human type of facial palsy, see, yes. uh, usually in strokes, uh, cranial nerves are not usually involved. Why the why the cranial nerves are not involved, and why facial nerve alone is so uh, the facial nerve, uh, the fibers go close to the corticospinal tract fibers in the internal capsule, so in the genu of the internal capsule, so they get affected, and it's human in nature. Uh, because all the cranial nerves are bilateral representation in the cortex. Okay, only the facial nerve, that too, only that is uh, giving uh, fibers to the lower part of the face or unilateral. Okay, they are not having a bilateral representation. representation yes, sir. So that is the only reason. Okay. Any other part of any other nerve is also unilateral, you know. But uh, it would be much useful like uh, facial nerve because you will be knowing about facial nerve. So it is in the 12th nerve also. There will be slightly it will be affected. Um, the nerve to genioglosis okay, has unilateral representation. Okay. 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 Now you can. Uh, and vagus posture of fibula is deviated to left. Palatal and pharyngeal reflex reduced in the right side. Uh, is able to shrug the shoulder against resistance and able to turn it against resistance. Um, there is no deviation of tongue on protrusion. No fibrillation and wasting. Is able to fold the tongue and press against a buccal aspect of cheek. On palpation, the tongue is firm, sir. Okay. So. When it comes to the twelfth nerve, uh, can you tell me uh, the movement of the tongue is to uh, which side if it is affected? Deviation same, of same side, sir. So along yeah, twelfth is the same side, and along with which other cranial nerve also the same. Twelve side. and five same sides, sir. Seven and nine, uh, nine and ten opposite sides, sir. Seven and ten. Seven and ten. Okay, so that is something a mnemonic for uh, which. My uh, professor told that is the rule of 17. Oh, okay. Yes. 5 yes. and 12 toward the same uh, same side, uh, to the disease side, and 7 and 10. So 5 and 12 is 17, and 10 plus 7 17. So the rule of 17. So okay. this is for you to easy to remember. For You don't have to, certain things you may have to mug up because of the examination time. You may get confused with so much of pressure on you. So 5 and 12 to the normal side. That's why facial always you see the angle of uh, deviation angle of uh, uh, mouth is deviated to the normal side. Okay. With the bulk, there is no uh, apparent wasting, sir. Both upper and lower limb. Okay. Uh, tone, upper and lower limb, both tone is normal and power in all the joints with all the movements, it was 5 by 5 and finger grip is 100%, sir. Okay. 
um, uh, reflexes, superficial reflex intact, conjunctival reflex intact, pharyngeal is, redu is, is reduced in the right side, abdominal reflex present, remastic is not done, sir, bilateral plantar flexor. Okay. Uh, jaw jack is not exaggerated. Uh, all deep, uh, deep tendon reflexes are 2 plus, sir. Why you want to have a exaggerated? Why can't it be normal? Sir, patient, uh, patient, it can be normal. Normally, patient, uh, sometimes patient, normal people can also have absent jaw jack, sir. Yeah, absent is important. Normal. Why exaggerated? You said jaw jack. It's, uh, not exaggerated. Uh, so upper cervical cord lesions can have a jaw jack, exaggerated jaw jack, sir. Okay. So, what does the what is the level of what does it tell you? What does it represent? Jaw presence of uh, exaggerated jaw jerk? Or uh, where is the level of lesion? I mean, what does it tell you? What is correspond to? Above C5, sir. Mm. Hmm? Above C5? Which nucleus? Mesencephalic nucleus. In mm. Right, right. Yes. Okay. Continue. Uh, cerebral limb test for coordination in both upper and lower limb was normal, sir. And uh, there was no dysmetria, ataxia present and swaying to right, and nystagmus bilateral gaze evoked nystagmus with fast component to right. There was no intentional tremors, no staccato scanning speech, tone was normal, uh, and no rebound phenomenon or titubation, sir. Am I audible, sir? Uh, oh, I would can you first. just yeah, now you're audible. Yes, sir. Am I sir not able to hear, sir? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay. So can you tell me on this particular thing in nystagmus? Yes, uh, there was gay evoked nystagmus with fast mm -hmm. component to the right, sir. Mm -hmm. So when the patient looks on to the right, the fast component toward the right. When the patient looks on to the left, the fast component is also to the right. Yes, sir. That's how in uh, that's how it happens um, about a cerebellar lesion, because you, since you use the word gaze evoked nystagmus, it is usually depicts cerebellar the origin of the nystagmus is cerebellar. Um, it's the fast component always project to the site of lesion, sir. Yeah, fast coming to the site of lesion, but you have, you said both with fast coming to the right. But generally, so gaze evoked definitely. Like left also, the, it will be right. See, so it uh, is gaze evoked. Always oh. remember. So when the gaze is evoked, the, it is toward the, so where the gaze is going, the right direction of the gaze. Oh. So if it is going to be looking at the right, the fast component should be the right. If the patient is looking toward the left, the fast component should be to the left. Okay. Oh. Okay. That's how it is. If it is going to be gaze evoked nystagmus. Because okay. your, your nystagmus is to differentiate between whether it is a central or a peripheral or a vestibular or cerebellar, isn't it? Yes, sir. Since you use the gaze evoked, you're talking about uh, a bidirectional nystagmus, isn't it? Yes, sir. So in gaze evoked, it's always toward this Side where you look to okay. the direction. Okay, sir. Uh, ataxia is present. Yes, sir. So what are the differences between sensory ataxia and cerebral? Uh, uh, cerebral ataxia is a white based, uh, the patient will have white based gait associated with it. Sensory ataxia, patient will look down and walk, so he'll keep uh, looking down and walking. Um, with eyes closed, sensory ataxia will be more aggravated. Um, okay, second point is correct. The first point is even uh, sensory ataxia can be white based. Okay. Sir. And it will be high step. High step. Yes. Usually, cerebellar ataxia won't be high step. Yes. So, in so white based ataxia with the high stepping is sensory ataxia, without uh, high stepping is cerebellar ataxia. Oh. Okay. I will be apraxic gate. Apraxic gate patient, uh, magnetic gate, sir. Patient, uh, magnetic gate. What is valving gate? 
Oh, Adeline gate will occur in um, uh, low, um, uh, when the glute, uh, gluteus, media, uh, gluteus muscles affected, sir. Adeline gate mainly ineffectiveness of the proximal muscles. So, yes. the conditions with causing Adeline gate are usually myopathies or congenital dislocation of hip, like that. Okay. Okay. Vinisha, uh, the previously, yes, I mean, again, I'm little one one more PG question for uh, when it comes to nystagmus. How do you look for a difference between peripheral and central nystagmus on the bedside? Um, so, uh, the patient, uh, we have to hold the uh, high. There is, there, there is an. Uh, there is an uh, a mnemonic for also for that. What all things you should do? Head, sir. Head dimples, nystagmus. Hmm. Yes. Head dimples, uh, nystagmus, and uh, T something. Hmm. I don't remember the T, sir. Yeah, what is head dimples? Uh, I don't know the correct, sir. I don't remember. So it is not hinge. It is hinge. Okay. Head dimples, nystagmus, and test for skew deviation. Okay, sir. Okay, so because these are all things that happen when there is going to be, I mean, your skew happens only when there is a central cause. Yes. It never occurs in uh, periphery, isn't it? Yes. But then you have, uh, because everything, uh, the skew deviation, everything, what is skew deviation, by the way? Uh, so one, uh, one eye will go up and one will go down, sir. So there is a, a vertical misalignment of the yes. both eyeballs, isn't it? Yes, sir. Hmm. So you are looking for nystagmus in uh, nystagmus. You are looking in, in if it is a central cause, it is going to be it can be any direction. Hmm? That's why you call that skew deviation also comes in any direction. You have nystagmus, but in uh, periphery it is always going to be horizontal. Okay. Uh, head dimples when you try to look into the one side, the, the suddenly there is because of the vestibular apparatus is damaged. There is going to be sudden. There is going to be a a catch up saccade, okay? Okay. Sir. That is called the head impulse. When you turn, when you tilt the head toward the, uh, toward the affected, away from the affected side, okay? Okay, sir. Sure. So that's why it is called the catch up saccade. That impulse is going to be uh, abnormal in when it's going to be periphery because there's a periphery, peripheral uh, system, the utricle, the saccules, and the, the semilunar canals are affected. But in central, there is no, the head impulse test is always going to be normal. Understood? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, so the hints is something that you know, you may be asked in your examination. H-A-N-T-S. Okay. Head impulse, nystagmus, and test for skew deviation. Okay, sir. Next. Uh, sensory system, superficial touch, pain, and temperature by uh, both right and left side presence, sir. Deep uh, pressure, deep pain, by uh, for, uh, timed vibrations more than 10 seconds in the lower limb, and position sense also is present. With respect to cortical sensation, tactile localization, uh, two point discrimination, stereognosis, and graphosis are present, sir. So, sensory system is intact, sir. Okay. Um, there is absent signs of meningeal irritation. Rob, uh, patient uh, gait, while trying to assess the gait, patient is swaying to right, even with eyes open. Uh, so, rhombox test not done. So spine and cranium, normal. There was no peripheral nerve thickening or tenderness. Other system examination, CVS, S1, S2 hurt. No associate murmurs. Uh, respiratory system, there was normal vesicular breath sounds. No added sounds. Per abdomen soft, no organomegaly. Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry, I didn't uh, follow the one. You said Romberg's test not done. Yeah. Yes, sir. Reason? Uh, sir, patient had swaying uh, even with eyes open, sir. Hmm. So, with eyes, um, yeah, so we didn't do the so, so what is for the For the completion sake, what is the Romberg test, uh, relevance of the Romberg's test? Posture column, sir. Okay. Completions. Yeah. Patient will have swaying, sir. Okay, why? Uh, sir, um, the patient, uh, proprioception is lost. Sir. So when the eyes are closed, the visual input also is reduced. So patient will love swaying. So the correction of the visual axis, uh, which is been there, it is being cut off. Okay. That's what I said. There is always a nature's way of uh, 
getting the body into balance head position the head with the space yes. so that uh, corrective uh, signal is cut off okay okay continue uh, so with the history and examination uh, uh, concluding with the provisional diagnosis it is an acute onset the neurological deficits a patient had are ataxia to right uh, probably the deficit is uh, defect is in the connections of cerebellum uh, with involvement of lower motor neuron type of cranial nerve 7 9 and 10 uh, with examination we came that was in the right side uh, with gaze evoked nystagmus with the uh, false component towards the uh, site of gaze uh, based on this, uh, based on the examination now, localization is in a right lateral medulla with involvement of inferior cerebellar peduncle and pontal medullary junction. Uh, with the history and examination diagnosis, we can probably it's an acute non-hemorrhagic infarct in the right lateral medulla, right inferior cerebellar peduncle, and right pontal medullary junction. Sir. How do you say peduncle is being affected? Uh, so that uh, inferior cerebellar peduncle has connections with lateral medulla, so, so that. Cause the ataxia to the right, sir. So that is the reason for ataxia. Proper place. Why pondo medullary junction? Seventh in our involvement, sir. Seventh in our So, so uh, when it comes to cerebral, uh, sorry, sir, please continue. Sir, you, you continue. Sir. You continue. Sir. Is it audible, sir? Hello? Yes, sir. It's audible, sir. Uh, sir, is the, sir, is there a line? So, means if I can put the question in another uh, way. You can, you can put the question, sir. You can. Yeah. Sir. If it is going to be a paleocerebellum, what will be the kind of uh, ataxia the patient will say in his Uncle ataxia, sir. It will be mostly gentle and side-to-side -side ataxia. Okay, sir. But when it is going to be a flocular nodular uh, Low, then you get the reeling gait, that so called drunken gait. Okay, sir. Okay. And if it is going to be uh, middle cerebral peduncle? Uh, cerebellar uh, peduncle? Contralateral ataxia, sir. Yeah. So, either yeah. will be contralateral. Lateral. They have a spastic ataxia. Okay, sir. Okay. So, inferior cerebellar, cerebellar peduncle sometimes, you know, have all the feature that suggests you of a vestibular type. So you have to be careful. So you have made here as an inferior cerebellar peduncle. So you have to uh, tell the examiner that because they mimic totally a periphery cause, I mean like vestibular apparatus uh, signs. Okay. So you have to be careful when you talk about. Uh, so in this patient, probably inferior cerebellar peduncle as well as flocular nodular lobe can also be involved. Does he have does he have history of consumption of alcohol? No, sir. He denies history of consumption of alcohol. What's his occupation? A uh, watchman, sir. Okay. What is rule of four in uh, the instance? Sorry, sir. I can't hear you, sir. Rule of four. Um, there will be four cranial nerves in the midline. Um, three, um, three, four, six, and twelve, sir. And four medial structures, four lateral structures. Okay. Uh, four medial structures starting with letter M, medial lemniscus, MLF, uh, motor nucleus of 12th nerve and motor pyramid, and uh, four S is spinothalamic tract, uh, sympathetic tract, spinal nucleus of trigeminal, and... Um, um, uh, you said vascular, isn't it? So which vessel are you trying to implicate? Uh, vertebral artery, more vertebral artery, sir. Mm -hmm. More than pica, sir. More than pica, posterior inferior cerebral artery. Mm -hmm. Why? If it, yeah, why? Sir, that um, vertebral artery is a major source of blood supply that gives a branch shape pica, which supplies lateral, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in previous books, older books, they will say pica is the most common reason, but now it is, it is vertebral. It's like you ask in MC to say your table. Okay, and there are four motor nuclei yes, in sir. the medulla, four in the pons, and two in midbrain. Above the four, above the uh, pons. So that is the uh, uh, rule, another rule of four. There are four rules of you said okay. all the three. Okay, this is the only thing you are left. So in medulla, there are four cranial nerves. 
and in ponds for perennial loss and four is above ponds because two things will not be in midbrain also olfactory and because they are the direct connection okay okay so trigeminal uh, how many uh, nucleus are there um, four nucleus are there sir uh, so, so that four no i am telling again oh, so what are the four um one is a motor nuclei sensory nuclei mesencephalic nuclei one is spinal nucleus of trigeminal sir and sensory you also call it as a primary sensory nucleus because since there are going to be spinal tract is also involved that has also sensory so there are two sensory component and you have also the motor nuclei so how is the uh, representation um, of the spinal tract or the i mean because when you are having effect in the brain stem um spinal nucleus is there in the medulla sir yeah. so medulla. if there is an effect how will it be in clinically how will you make it out clinically um ipsilateral loss of facial sensation sir mm. now mm. how are they uh, what is the uh, represented as when the spinal tract is a long tract isn't it it yes. is not a small the spinal nucleus which is a descent isn't it yes sir mm. I no idea. Sir. So, what are the features of uh, uh, lateral medullary syndrome? Um, patient, uh, uh, based on the structure involved, uh, sympathetic pathway structure involved, patient will have ipsilateral Horner syndrome. Um, so this patient doesn't have. Didn't have, sir. And uh, spinothalamic tract involved, patient will have contralateral loss of pain and temperature, which was absent in this patient. Uh, because of involvement of nucleus ambiguous, that is a uh, ninth and tenth nerve, no? patient will have hoarseness uh, and dysphagia, which is present in this patient. Uh, a spinal nucleus of trigeminal, there will be ipsilateral loss of facial sensation that is not there in this patient. Ipsilateral attack sac is there, sir, in this patient. And uh, vestibular nucleus involved, patient will have uh, nausea, vomiting, vertigo, and yeah. astigmatism, sir. One more thing that I would like to add on, maybe I lost the audio in between is that you have an inverted representation. Okay, so forehead will be represented below and the mandibular uh, would be represented above when you have the, the long tract of the spinal nucleus is involved. So okay. it is called the inverted representation. That's also another a question that examiners would love to, for the discriminator to give you more marks. Okay, so okay. find out what you mean by the inverted representation. Okay, sir. Okay, so can you tell me what do you, uh, I mean, so you are not thinking in terms of, uh, so what, do you want to put everything as one syndrome or, or do you have an a patchy, it's a uh, patchy, law, patchy improvement? Hmm. Pa uh, sir, so patient can also have improvement in the symptoms, sir. Uh, all the symptoms of, uh, they say all the symptoms of uh, medullary infarct will improve except the basal uh, nuclei symptoms. So probably the patient's other symptoms improved. So, what do you mean by pseudo spinal pattern? Pseudo spinal pattern. Um, no idea, sir. So, sometimes uh, we, uh, we, when you have a lesion, as a, especially when you're talking about the lateral medullary syndrome, because where you know that the pain and temperature loss will be confined only to the uh, contralateral lower limb, okay? Yes. Or to, so to some extent to the trunk as well. Because the spinothalamic tract is there, no? Yes, sir. So it will be only a little part of the, that is the, the lateral part of the spine. What is the pattern of, uh, what is the, how are they uh, been, uh, what is the pattern of the arrangement of the fibers in the spinothalamic tract? A uh, lemina arrangement, uh, except for the post, uh, posterior column, uh, the corticospinal spinothalamic, uh, sacral, th uh, sacral lumbar thoracic cervical, so from lateral to medial. For posterior uh, column, it will be no, sacral. No, don't, don't, don't confuse now. So I'm just asking about spinothalamic. So uh, we... sir, it will be like uh, um, sacral in the uh, lateral side, sir. Sacral. So that's exactly I said. When there is a lateral medullary syndrome, the lateral most part of the spinothalamic tract alone will be involved. If it is so, so what will happen? Your sacrum as well as your uh, low, uh, lumbar and lower lumbar. Only, yeah, only sacral and lumbar fibers will be affected. So, patient will have loss of that the dissociated sensory loss. That is pain and temperature loss will be confined only to the lower contralateral lower limb. And yes. that will be mistaken as a spinal cord lesion. Okay. Understood? 
Okay. So sir. that should become as a differential diagnosis. That's why it's called pseudo spinal pattern. We may think it's said because you have a level of uh, sensory level is being obtained, isn't it? Yes, sir. There is a high chance that we may think there is probably this is a case of a spinal cord lesion. Okay. Sir. But whereas uh, you have the the area of I mean the pathology lies much above uh, because of the only the lateral most part of the spinothalamic tract are getting affected. Okay. Yes. And your face will be preserved. So that is something called you should know. That is something you can be asked at the end of your presentations. So pseudo spinal pattern. Okay. So what are the uh, salient points uh, of uh, lateral medullary syndrome? Uh, patient have will something have unique, unique unique about lateral medullary. I am not asking about the what are the features of lateral medullary. What is something unique? Develop multiple uh, patients compared, develop... compared with other. Uh, CVA. Uh, so patient will have multiple um, uh, nerve, cranial nerve palsies will be there, sir. And uh... but common things. You don't don't think that I'm asking you uncommon thing. Yeah. So actually, motor system is involved in most of the system that we talk, isn't it? Yes, sir. Oh, because the pyramidal tract is uh, uh, supplied by the is in the medial. Uh, yes, what is the pyramidal tract supplied by? Which artery? Middle cerebral artery, sir. No. Yeah, yeah. Middle cerebral artery in the in medulla. When it comes medulla, to... uh, vertebral artery, sir. It is in the medial aspect. Yeah, it is the medial aspect. So mostly it is the ICA that gives you the blood supply, isn't it? Yes. Sir. Oh. How will be the plantar area? Lateral Plantar in what, sir? Lateral medullarism. Sir, so there is no uh, uh, there is no cortical uh, pyramidal tract involvement in lateral yeah. medullary. So okay. plantar is normal. Um, okay. hmm. So there are different ways of asking the same question. Hmm? Okay. We have already said. So just whether you have understood the concept of the candidate has understood the concept, we uh, same thing will be asked in a different way. Hmm. So here, uh, it is the motor system is spared in lateral medullary central. That is something that you need to always think about. Okay. Okay. And uh, anything to do with uh, two things, hiccups. If the patient complains of hiccups, the medulla is a center for hiccups, sir. Hmm. All the all medulla itself. Um, med hmm. there is center for hiccups in medulla. Patient can complain of hiccups in medullary. Also lateral. Again, it comes over the same area that we are talking about. So okay. if the patient has hiccups, you should think of. Uh, we have dorsal lateral region, but it will be uh, that is something that patient or usually comes hiccups. Okay, yes. and one more thing is something that is very unique is about sneezing because sneezing center is also supposed to be uh, somewhere in the medulla that is in the upper part of the dorsal lateral. So hiccups and sneezing. So patient has paroxysmal sneezing. Okay, and once you have ruled out other uh, local causes, periphery causes, please try I also look into whether this is also something to do with the when the patient keeps on have bouts of sneezing. Okay, okay so sneezing center is also supposed to be in the uh, upper dorsal lateral medulla. Okay, what is on curse? On curse, patient, uh, um, the patient. We'll have respiratory paralysis, uh, mountain curse. Hmm. The where is the lesion? Medulla, sir. Medulla. Oh, we are talking about all medulla. So I'm questioning also is medulla mm -hmm. because of the the lesions in the reticular formation, which is adjacent to the nucleus ambiguous. What is nucleus ambiguous? Uh, sir, so nucleus ambiguous is the ninth and um, tenth nerves uh, nucleus, sir. So when you have lesions, uh, lesion uh, subserving the area of uh, nucleus ambiguous and the adjacent reticular formation, you have the failure of the automatic breathing, which is called the ontine curse. Yes. Okay. Sir, can we move to the next slide, sir? Hello, sir. Apadra, sir can we move to the next slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
So after admitting the patient and after stabilizing the um, stabilizing him, the basic investigations were sent. A uh, complete hemogram was normal. His blood sugars and HbA1c's were, was elevated. Uh, serum electrolytes was normal. And thyroid and renal RFT showed no derangement. Echo showed uh, echo. There were features of LVH present. Uh, carotid Doppler done showed intermediate media thickness of the right common curve arteries thickened up to 2.0 mm cons compared to the left side, which was only 0.9 mm. Okay. Um, a neuroimaging done, a MRI brain showed there were two um, hyperintensities noted, one in right cerebellum and one in the right hemimedulla. The one I'm showing is the uh, largest in the right cerebellum. That is the one I'm showing. That is can you do the cursor? Uh, this is, there's already a cursor. Oh, yes, sir. Patient is having one uh, lesion. This is the cerebellum, sir. And... Uh, uh, MRI diffusion weight imaging is same, of done the same uh, for the patient and this is a restriction. Diffusion restriction is seen so it suggests your acute infarct in the patient. This is the diffusion restriction for that infarct. Uh, Followed up, we did MR angiography for the patient. And uh, we can see, uh, we have to notice that right side, the vertebral artery is hypoplastic. Left side, it is present and joins to form the basilar artery. So. We can see right side there is no vertebral, but left side there is a vertebral artery and this is joining to form the basilar artery. But right side is completely thrombosed or thrombosed. In this patient, it's thrombosed. Mm. Yes, sir. Oh. That, uh, that's all, sir. Just some few points. Okay. Uh, she presented very nicely, sir. I uh, learned a lot, of, lot from you also, sir. <laughs> Come on, sir. Your way of... Uh, Taking care of students is uh, very good, sir. So she presented uh, in a very nice one. Thank you, sir. Uh, any any concluding remarks from you, sir? Uh, I think she presented very well, but only thing I, I would like you, Vinisha, that in your examination, you try to be little, I mean, slow in your presentation because when you're talking very fast, we have, uh, as an examiner, we have more time to ask you more questions. Yes, sir. So, yes. university exam, you have to be careful that take it slowly so that uh, you you answer very well, but then make sure that uh, in a hurry, you should not make many mistakes. So, today is just a kind of an, uh, what do you call the way that how you ask questions in an examination day. So, yes. in examination day, when you are physically having eye to eye contact, things are totally different. So, we are not in the comfort zone. We are in front of and we have the time. Here you have enough time to present the case, see the case and do it methodologically. But in university exam, it's a total different ball game. So be a little slow in your uh, the way you talk. So a little pause between the sentence. Otherwise, you did extremely well. I'm Thank very you. happy about it. I think uh, any questions from the other PGs or other, uh, I mean, attendees? Uh, put in the chat box. They won't be allowed, sir. Oh, okay. No. Sorry. <laughs> So, nothing, sir. They will be seeing in the live stream, sir. Okay. So, only faculties will be there. So, since uh, Saranan, sir, is not uh, today uh, available, sir, you, he, he went for a family meeting. So, it's better uh, we will conclude, sir. Uh, yes, I once again thanks the PG for wonderful presentation. And I would like to thank Academic Dean and uh, Professor and HOD of uh, SRO for having a very good live session. Um, and it will be helpful for all PGs across India. I would take. Uh, I would like to thank API Central and as well as API Tamil Nadu for having hope on the Changalpati API and giving us the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Exigan, you can uh, close. Yes. So you, you can stop sharing. Thank you and good night. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Hexagon Consultancy, you can you can close it. Thank you, sir.